Hello, everybody, and welcome to another lecture of 6838. Today, we're going to continue our discussion of vector fields, but as usual in 6838, we kind of ping back and forth between theory and practice, and today we're going to focus more on the algorithmic side. Uh, in particular, what we're going to focus on is figuring out how to take some of that vector field theory that we just laid out in the previous lecture and try to make it work on discrete domains specifically on triangulated surfaces, tetrahedral meshes, those sorts of domains. Now, in an additional lecture segment that I've kind of attached to this one on the course spreadsheet, I also recorded a very different vector field design problem that appears in machine learning in a new kind of emerging area called normalizing flows. I encourage you all to take a look there, and maybe we'll get the chance to view it in lecture time as well. Uh, for an interesting application that basically appears in variational inference rather than in vector field design on triangle meshes. But once again, it uses kind of similar math, uh, just like the usual patterns that we've seen in this course. Now, vector field design is one of these gigantic topics of research in geometry, processing, computer graphics, and related areas. It's also one of my least favorite ones to talk about, I'll be honest. <laughs> I think there are many better qualified people out there on the internet uh, than I am. So what I kind of settled on in this particular course is that we're going to keep it pretty short. I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to some of the high-level ideas, again, borrowing a lot from the SIGGRAPH course from Fernando de Goish and colleagues. Uh, we're going to have a short lecture segment on it here. In our course materials, I'll provide you all with some pointers to additional reading and um, other YouTube channels, actually, that really cover this particular topic in depth. I think our time is better spent elsewhere, and uh, those students who are excited about this topic uh, can do a little more additional reading. But this course is already pretty dense as, as, as it is, so we're going to just keep it short just to be able to say that we covered this topic a little bit. So in our previous lecture, we gave a whirlwind introduction to the theory of vector fields on manifolds. We talked about how to differentiate vector fields, in particular we motivated that there is both a Lie derivative and a covariant derivative. Uh, we defined vector fields on surfaces and suggested a few applications, both in theory and in practice, for why you might want a vector field. Today, we're going to move to the right-hand side and talk about how to discretize derivatives and, or, or vec rather, discretize vector fields and their derivatives on surfaces and some of the common practices people use for doing that. Now, one of the interesting things that we're going to see in this lecture is that there actually isn't broad consensus on how to discretize a vector field, even just on a triangulated mesh, like our favorite uh, pig here. Uh, in particular, there are actually many different places on a mesh where you could put vector field data. We could put it on the triangles, for example, just one vector per triangle face. Uh, we've actually already seen that in this course. We could put it on the edges, like the dot product between our field and the edges of the mesh. That leads to something called a one form, uh, which is popular in the discrete exterior calculus universe. Or uh, we could try and place vectors on vertices of triangle meshes, which is kind of nice in that we already know how to differentiate functions when they're one value per vertex of a mesh, but it's also a little bit tricky because vertices don't have well-defined tangent planes. So we'll see that there's advantages and disadvantages to each one of these options, and our goal here isn't to tell you which one is best, but just to kind of highlight some of the high-level ideas that appear in this research area. In particular, today, we're going to focus on the triangle-based and vertex-based representations. We're going to defer edge-based to discussion of discrete exterior calculus, which is not a topic we're going to cover in this course. If you guys nudge me a little bit, I do have slides around, and we could record a few extra lectures on it just for completeness on this YouTube channel. Um, so we'll see if uh, I have extra time and if there's some interest in that topic. Uh, Keenan Crane's YouTube channel also goes into that particular topic in a ton of depth and is a great place to look. So in any event, let's get started by talking about triangle-based vector field representations. To me, this is really the easiest one to think about and manipulate, and we've actually already seen it in this course. In particular, if you recall, uh, one thing that we did is we represented functions in the finite element world as one value per vertex of a triangle mesh, and we talked about taking gradients of those functions, which gives you one vector per triangle in the plane of that triangle. So that was actually our first example of a triangle-based vector field. But of course, not all vector fields are gradients of functions. 
In fact, that's kind of a deep fact from uh, differential topology. Uh, so we need a more general representation to work with. So the high-level picture of triangle-based vector fields is pretty straightforward on triangle meshes. So remember that when we use the phrase vector field, really what we mean is an assignment of one tangent vector per point uh, on our surface. Now that word tangent is really critical here. So for example, if I have a 3D uh, domain or like a 2D surface sitting in 3D, then typically when we use the phrase vector field, we don't just mean like attaching a vector in R3 to every point on a, on a surface. Sometimes we do, like in simulation, deformation, maybe that's the right uh, idea. But uh, in vector field design, typically we have a constraint, which is that the vectors have to be tangent to the surface at the sort of points where they're attached. Now, the question is how to express that tangency constraint. And if you represent your vector field as one vector per triangle on a triangle mesh, I would argue that's probably the simplest way to do that. Uh, in particular, if you have one vector per triangle, the triangle defines a plane, right? I mean, the three vertices of the triangle form a plane. So uh, if you want to express a vector in the plane of the triangle, it's totally reasonable to think of that vector as being tangent to your discrete surface. So if you think about it, the number of degrees of freedom in a triangle-based vector field is two times the number of triangles. Why is it two? Well, the tangent plane to each triangle is a two-dimensional space. And indeed, on the uh, kind of upper right here, you can see that maybe you parameterize that uh, uh, tangent space using two orthogonal vectors in the, uh, the triangle plane. Of course, that choice of two vectors is not unique, and there's not really a canonical one. Um, but a very typical thing to do in code and triangle-based uh, tangent vector fields is to explicitly store a UV basis for each triangle. It kind of makes a lot of calculations easier. Now, the advantage of a triangle-based vector field is that it's somehow very easy to think about, but there are also disadvantages as well. So remember, when we talked about Laplacian operator, we discretize it on a triangle mesh by using first-order finite elements. And that first order property allowed us to compute at least one gradient um, of our function because it was linearly interpolated from vertices into the interiors of triangles. We might think of a triangle-based vector field as somehow piecewise constant, right? So our vector field is, or is constant along the entire triangle plane. That, by the way, aligns with taking the gradient of a piecewise linear function per vertex. That's great, but what it means is you really can't differentiate a triangle-based vector field particularly easily uh, the same, using the same machinery that we developed in previous lectures for finite elements. Uh, and moreover, our triangle-based vector field is discontinuous at the edges and vertices. That said, triangle-based vector fields do have one really nice geometric property, which is that it's very easy to define a parallel transport operator, which is kind of illustrated on the bottom left here. Now remember that parallel transport is the idea of taking a vector at one point and kind of dragging it along a surface to another point while minimizing the amount of twist that happens in the tangent plane. So when I move my vector from one point to another, I do have to change the vector. I can't just displace them because I have this tangency constraint, but I don't want it like spinning around unnecessarily in the tangent plane. And it turns out that a really obvious discretization, almost a more easy way to think about uh, parallel transport than in the smooth theory, is to take two triangles, kind of think of that shared edge like a hinge, like this, unhinge it so that they share the same plane, and then take a vector and just translate it from one triangle into the other, like what you see in this figure on the bottom left. And this gives you a way to parallel transport a vector from one triangle to the next, which is really, really straightforward. It's, it's actually quite nice. So that actually leads to a notion that's the uh, discrete Levi-Civita connection. My undergrad differential geometry professor called it Levi-Civita, and I've never been 100% sure which one is correct. But in any event, the, uh, the discrete connection is essentially a very simple notion of parallel transport or of comparing vectors in two different adjacent triangles. And again, the way that we do it, as illustrated on the bottom right here, is to take those adjacent triangles, unfold them, and then just scoot the vector over and then fold it back in a rigid way. Again, I think this is actually easier to think about than connections and covariant derivatives on smooth surfaces. Somehow this definition 
is quite concrete, whereas you need to do quite a bit of homework to uh, make this work in a smooth case. Now here's one kind of interesting observation, which actually you all already thought about on your homework as well in this course, which is the following. Let's say that I have a vector on a triangle, and I look at one of the vertices adjacent to that triangle. Now what I'm going to do is take a loop of triangles around that vertex, like what you see on the lower left here, and I'm going to parallel transport that vector from one triangle to the next. Here's the thing. If I take that vector and I transport it all the way around a loop so that I go back to the triangle that I started with, what you'll see is that that vector actually is likely to have rotated. And here's why. So let's say that I take this little one ring like what you see on the bottom left of this slide, and I'm going to take one of the edges in that one ring and just cut along it. Or I'm going to take a pair of scissors and cut along one of the black edges on the lower left. So what, what do we end up with? So there's five triangles. I've cut along it. And now that I've cut, I can basically map it into the plane, right? So here is maybe our, uh, so there's one triangle, two, three, four, five. So here are our five triangles, like that. I'm sorry, my paint is a little drippy today. Huh. Um, and because I've, I've mapped them into the plane, uh, now we have this kind of extra space here. Uh, because this is the edge where we, we took our pair of scissors and we cut, okay? So think about what parallel transport is doing. So let's say that I have a vector in this plane of this triangle, okay? So now that I've unfolded all of these vectors into the plane after I cut, parallel transport is really just translating this identical vector like that. But now, I need to figure out how to take that vector and translate it back to the original triangle. Here's one kind of fun way that you can think about how you could do it. This is actually the way that I sort of was able to wrap my head around discrete Gaussian curvature. In particular, we're going to continue doing kind of scissors and glue exercise. And one thing that we could do is take our pair of scissors and now cut along a different edge, which is this one. So we're going to cut along this edge here. What we're going to do is we're going to take this triangle and we're going to pivot it about this shared vertex. And what we're going to end up with is a rotated version of the same triangle. Maybe it's like that over here. Now, as I pivot this triangle about the shared edge, what's going to happen to this vertex? Well, now when I move this vertex, it moves along with the triangle. So it actually rotates. Maybe it looks like this now. It's like rotated to the left. OK? I know this is a little hard to draw. I should have animated it on the slides, but I'm a lazy professor. So what does this mean? If I want to take this vector here and parallel transport it around this one ring and back, here's how I can do it. Well, I take scissors to one edge, and now parallel transport is literally just moving the base point of my vector. But now I've got this, this space here that I need to fill. So the way that I'm going to do that is by pivoting this triangle about the shared vertex. But now this vector has to move with it. And what I end up with is a vector that is at an angle. And what is that angle? Like, what is the theta here? That theta is precisely the angle that I needed to share about that pivot. And remember, what is Gaussian curvature? Discrete integrated Gaussian curvature on a surface is 2 pi minus the sum of the interior angles. Like, I guess here it would be theta i, where the theta i's are here. And that, you know, sort of difference between 2 pi, which is the planar sum of angles, and the sum of the actual angles, is precisely the amount that this one triangle needs to pivot to take our vector back to where it started. So despite my ugly drawing here, if we step back, one thing that you can convince yourself, and I hope you all make nice, ni much nicer pictures at home to do so, is that if I take a vector and I parallel transport it around a loop, what I'll end up with is a rotated version of that same vector in the same triangle tangent plane. And the amount that it rotates is exactly the integrated Gaussian curvature. Notice, for example, that when the theta i's sum to 2 pi, remember that means that I have a flat vertex, like there's zero Gaussian curvature. In that particular case, I don't have to unfold everything to a plane because it's already planar. 
and indeed there's no holonomy. I, I, can, I can take my vector, uh, parallel transport in a loop, and end up where I started. So in general, this phenomenon that we can get Gaussian curvature by parallel transporting a vector around a loop and observing the angle that it rotated in the process, this idea is called holonomy. Uh, and it's one of the really powerful ways to kind of sense curvature on a manifold that actually extends really nicely into higher dimensional manifolds as well. Notice that our definition of Gaussian curvature was kind of 2D surface specific, right? We, we talked about normal vectors and so on. Um, whereas this notion of holonomy, like angle excess as we parallel transport around a loop, is, is one that works on, on higher dimensional manifolds as well. Okay, so let me clean up a little bit. So this basic construction and this idea of angle deficit being related to parallel transport really has some, some pretty deep implications for discrete geometry processing, and it also can be extended in some interesting ways. So, for example, one thing that you can do is extend this idea to define what's called a connection on a surface. Now, the term connection is not one that we introduced in our previous lecture. I probably should have, but basically a connection is an object similar to a covariant derivative the way that we defined it, that essentially just is the sort of generalization in differential geometry giving a means of comparing vectors in adjacent tangent spaces, right? That's like what the covariant derivative allowed us to do. But we can actually express an arbitrary connection very easily on a triangulated surface uh, with this per triangle discretization by essentially thinking of there being a rotation angle on every single edge of our triangle mesh really every oriented edge, right? Like for a pair of adjacent triangles, you know, it's basically giving you, if I want to compare uh, vectors in these two adjacent triangles, I unfold them, I take a vector on one triangle, I translate it to the other, but now I can also rotate it by theta edge in the process. And with every choice of theta edge per edge, I define a different connection on our mesh. Notice that it has sort of different curvature and holonomy in a sense, right? If I go around a loop now, um, I don't just get the angle deficit, but it now gets changed by summing up the uh, theta edges on the, the edges here. And this actually gives a really interesting way to design a vector field on a surface. So this idea was introduced in the 2010s, both by um, Keenan Crane, and I think also there's some work from in, in, in France from Nicolas Ray and company, um, who introduced an idea of, of a trivial connection as one way to uh, design vector fields. And the basic idea here is that a trivial connection is one where my surface kind of looks flat with respect to the connection that I've, I've derived. So for instance, um, Remember that the connection that you get from parallel transport does not look flat, right? When I go around a loop, I get holonomy, which looks like the Gaussian curvature. Now that I'm allowed one value per edge of rotation, I could choose those values so that they sum up to zero around every discrete cycle at a vertex. Now, it turns out topologically, you can't do that on a surface. Um, it actually needs to add up to a number related to the Euler characteristic. And so essentially what goes on in the trivial connections research is to design a vector field by really designing a connection, right, like a way to take a vector at one triangle and drag it onto another triangle. But to design the connection so that there's basically zero holonomy on almost all the cycles, except at a few singular points where the vector maybe makes a complete loop of 360 degrees or something like that. And so the basic idea here is that by putting zero holonomy on all these discrete cycles, now it's sort of path independent how I do my parallel transport so long as I don't go around one of these cycles. Um, so this basic idea was explored in this Trivial Connections paper. It's also um, kind of extended to exterior calculus style notation in a nice note that was uh, released later by the authors and Fernando de Goish. Um, but essentially the algorithm is, is really straightforward and it's a nice way to design a smooth vector field on a surface. Essentially, your variable here is actually not the vector field, but rather this excess rotation per edge, which is kind of editing, you can think of, the, uh, the discrete uh, parallel transport operator that we already defined. And you add a linear constraint to that theta per edge that says around every little cycle around a vertex, for example, uh, I should be able to add up the theta edges, subtract the Gaussian curvature, something like that, and get zero, right? In other words, that my connection is trivial. 
Now, there are many of these. This turns out to be an underdetermined set of constraints once you prescribe the holonomia and all the vertices, so mostly zero, and then every once in a while, some multiple of 2 pi, for example. Uh, so uh, the way that these folks propose to solve that is to just minimize the uh, two norm of the theta thing considered as, as one value per edge. I think this quantity is a little bit hard to understand in the um, smooth universe, although uh, this, this document I mentioned that writes the trivial connections method and deck notation does a nice job of doing that. Um, but in some sense, it's like trying to come up with the best flat approximation of the, the levy uh, chivita connection. Um, and and there have been some nice attempts uh, after this paper to make that that objective function make a little more more sense uh, from a smooth perspective. So at the end of the day, uh, if you solve this problem, what do you get? Well, essentially, what this algorithm does is it lets you prescribe a few singular points. So for example, maybe the points that are marked on the bunny here, and then what it produces is a vector field. And the way that you do that is you optimize for the uh, trivial connection. So basically, the thing that minimizes that two norm subject to the linear constraint that it sums to zero around a lot of cycles or uh, and a few special constraints at singular points. And now I don't get a vector field. What I get is a connection. So to get a vector field, I place a vector on a single triangle and now I just kind of drag it to all the other triangles by following the connection. So like maybe on all the neighbors of that triangle, I unfold them, I translate, I rotate now by that theta edge, and then that becomes a vector on every other triangle. But thanks to the trivial connection constraint, I can actually just do this greedily, uh, and I'll still get a smooth field, which is pretty cool. So this is a very efficient, basically linear method uh, for optimizing for a field on a surface that has a lot of really nice properties. And the basic clever trick here is rather than optimizing for a field, you optimize for a connection, and then you just kind of place the field by spreading it all out afterward um, while following the connection. And it has this really nice property that essentially the field um, circulates around the vertices in a way that you prescribe. So like zero around most vertices, as you can see, like on the back of the bunny, there are no singularities. Um, and then it circulates around the colored vertices in a special fashion. I really shouldn't be using the word vector field, by the way, here. Like notice that actually this vector field has constant norm. Uh, right, because it's just obtained by taking a vector and kind of translating it around, um, which means from a differential geometry perspective, uh, you really should solve some other problem that maybe scales the field um, so that it's differentiable everywhere. Like for instance, in differential topology, you typically assume that your vector field has norm zero at the singular points to avoid anything blowing up. Uh, but there are ways to kind of go back and do that a posteriori. And for many graphics applications, that actually really doesn't matter. So. As a sort of second fun thing to think about uh, in the world of per triangle vector fields, uh, one other thing it allows you to do is to compute an object called the Helmholtz Hodge decomposition quite easily. Now, this is one that we can return to if we talk about DEC, but it actually makes perfect sense in the world of per triangle vector fields as well. So, the Helmholtz Hodge decomposition theorem basically says that I can take any vector field on a surface, I really like this beautiful illustration that our, our colleague Keenan Crane, who works a lot in this space, you'll see his name in these slides uh, quite a bit. Um, he made a really nice illustration of what's going on. I can take any vector field on a surface and I can express it as the sum of three parts. In fact, on your homework, I believe you're doing a similar style decomposition, but in the plane. In particular, I can write it as the sum of a curl-free piece, like what I show in the middle, Curl-free vector fields are vector fields that are gradients of functions. But it turns out that now if I take that curl-free piece and I subtract it off from my vector field, what I'm left with is a divergence-free vector field. That's one that only circulates, um, whereas a curl-free vector field doesn't circulate at all. Hopefully this is a bit of review from your uh, college calculus class just now wrapped around a surface instead of in the plane. Uh, it turns out that a divergence-free vector field on a surface can be written as the gradient of a function, and then you take, at, in every single tangent plane, um, you take the vector and you just rotate it 90 degrees. You can kind of see that, right? Like if you take this uh, nice circulatory vector field on the surface on the left, and you rotate all the vectors 90 degrees, suddenly you'll get something that looks kind of like a potential flow instead of circulation. 
And then finally, there's a third piece on the right, which is called harmonic. And these are vector fields that depend on the topology of the domain. So for example, on this donut here, there's a very special vector field that circulates around the loop of the donut. And of course, that is unique to being a donut with one hole. So in general, um, the space of harmonic vector fields is quite small. The dimension is 2 times g, where g is the genus. So related to the Hodge decomposition, or the Helmholtz Hodge decomposition, we can do kind of an interesting thing, which is a bit of degree of freedom counting. Now, in particular, so far in our lecture today, we've expressed vector fields as one vector per triangle, which means that the space of vector fields, at least is what we call phase-based vector fields, is two f dimensional, where f here is the uh, number of triangle faces of our triangle mesh. Now, one thing that we could do would be to say, OK, so what does that mean? That means we have 2f degrees of freedom to work with. The Helmholtz Hodge decomposition somehow suggests that we can take those 2f degrees of freedom and break them down in an interesting way. Now, in particular, I think we can work with the second two categories first and then kind of reverse engineer what's going to have to happen um, in the divergence-free category. So in particular, what we're going to assume is that the space of harmonic uh, vector fields is 2G dimensional. Notice that that's sort of independent of your discretization. Like it has to do with just the topology of the mesh. So a suitable discretization of harmonic vector fields probably is still 2G dimensional, right? Like there's no microstructure hiding there. So uh, in particular, we're going to, and this is an assumption we haven't really motivated in this course, but we're going to assume that harmonic vector fields are going to remain 2G dimensional. I'm going to not bother with the word dimensional here. And now, let's think about the space of curl-free vector fields. Those are vector fields that can be written as the gradient of a function. So we've already defined a gradient operator when we talked about the Laplacian. And the way that we did it was we took one number per vertex. We linearly interpolated that to the interior of every triangle. And then we took the gradient. Right? So even though, and it looked kind of like this, right? This was our, our, our picture there. So even though it kind of looks like there's one gradient vector per triangle, What's the actual dimensionality of the space of curl-free vector fields? Well, really, you can think of a curl-free vector field as being specified not by one vector per face, because then you need a linear condition, but rather just using that function f, right? So there's one value of f per vertex. So the space of curl-free vector fields on our triangular surface when you have a face space vector field, it's probably going to look kind of like V, right? Where I specify one value per vertex of our function f. Now, we have to be the tiniest bit careful because, of course, the gradient of the constant function is zero. Right? So there's a one-dimensional space of shifts I can make that are not sensed when I take the gradient. So really, this is V minus one-dimensional space. OK? So the question is, what remains? Yeah. Uh, in particular, um, what is the dimensionality then of divergence-free vector fields on, for phase space vector fields, assuming that the dimensionality of harmonic vector fields is 2G and the dimensionality of curl-free vector fields is V minus 1? Okay, so one thing that we can do is apply one of our favorite little formulas from uh, topology here. Remember that we, we talked about this formula long, long ago, that V minus E plus F is equal to the Euler characteristic chi, which is 2 minus 2 times the genus. OK? So now let's do a little bit of manipulation here. So remember, at the end of the day, the entire space of vector fields is 2F dimensional. So let's start with a 2F uh, on the left-hand side here. Ah, this pen. 2f. Well, what is that equal to? Well, it's equal to <laughs> 2 times f. But in particular, remember that what is f? Well, you can think of f as 2 minus 2g, right? That's the Euler characteristic, minus v plus e, like that. Okay? 
And of course, uh, we can multiply the two out just for fun. That's going to be equal to 4 minus 4g minus 2v plus 2e. Hopefully, you're with me so far. <laughs> um, and now, what I'm going to do is kind of isolate out the remaining dimensions. So we've kind of covered 2g dimensions of this 2f dimensional space with harmonic fields. I haven't told you how to do it, but there's some 2g dimensional space out there. There's a v minus 1 dimensional space, which we have defined carefully, of curl-free fields. So let's write this 2f in kind of a funny way. Let's say that it's equal to 2g right, plus v minus 1. And now, let's just isolate what the remaining number of dimensions is going to be, OK? So in particular, let's see. So we have a minus 1 and a 4 here, right? So now this is going to end up being a 5. We have a minus 4g and a plus 2g, so this is going to be minus 6g. We have a v minus 1 and a minus 2v. So uh, in particular, now this is going to be minus 3v. And the edge term didn't change, right? So it's still plus 2 times the number of edges. OK? Uh, and now I check my notes really quick. So we have 5 minus 6g minus 3v plus 2e. Cool. All right. I actually <laughs> had to pause the video and redo this part because I got the calculation wrong the last time. That's my bad. OK. So I claim that actually we can write this in a very clean fashion. OK? So I'm going to just isolate this thing here. Let's call him star. And see if we can write a better expression here. Because this one isn't particularly tidy. OK, so uh, let's simplify star, which is going to be the dimensionality of the, uh, the divergence-free vector fields on our surface. And here's what I'm going to do. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is plug in my expression uh, for the Euler characteristic, right? So 2 minus 2g is equal to v minus e plus, uh, plus f. So what do we know? We know 6 minus 6g, right, is uh, just multiplying this expression by 3, right? So it's 3v minus 3e plus 3f, OK? So if we plug in that expression here, what do we get? Well, 6 minus 6g is equal to this, but we only have a 5, so we're going to end up with a minus 1. Uh, and now we can plug in uh, plus 3v minus 3e plus 3f, like that. And now we still have our, our remaining terms, right? Minus 3v plus 2e, like that. OK, and let's simplify a little bit. Notice that we have a 3v and a minus 3v, so those cancel. We have a minus 3e and a plus 2e, so now this is just minus e. OK, so, and we have, uh, and that's it, yep. So we have a minus 1, the minus e here, and then we have a plus 3f. OK, so there's our, our, our dimensionality. Um, but in particular, this Euler characteristic formula only works when we don't have a boundary. And one thing that we showed in a very old lecture was when you don't have a boundary, there's a really nice little piece of reasoning here. Remember, it looks something like this. Uh, every edge is adjacent to two triangles, and every triangle is adjacent to three edges. Right? So in other words, we have 3 times the number of triangles is equal to um, 2 times the number of edges. OK, so what does that mean? Well, uh, what that means is that uh, this plus 3f is really plus 2e. We have a minus e here. OK, so at the end of the day, this is equal to e minus 1. OK, so what did we just show? <laughs> Essentially, we showed that if the space of phase space vector fields is 2f dimensional, which it is, right? Because it's just 
uh, an x and a y component per triangle, basically. And we already motivated why the space of curl-free fields, right? Those are fields that can be written as the gradient of a function is v minus one dimensional, right? Because a function is one value per vertex, but constant shifts don't do anything. And I kind of asserted that the space of harmonic vector fields is 2g. That one you're going to, have to take based on faith. I'll, I'll give you some pointers. Then in that case, we showed that the sort of remaining dimensions in that 2f is e minus one. So in other words, this is the dimensionality of the space of um, uh, divergence-free fields. And <laughs> you might, if you step back for a minute, you, what you should think about is like, that's kind of weird. <laughs> um, in particular, uh, here's why it feels a little weird at first. So if we go back to our picture here, remember that curl-free fields are fields that can be written as the gradient of a function. On a 2D surface, you can obtain divergence-free fields by taking the gradient of a function and just rotating it 90 degrees in the tangent plane, which might lead you to discretize it in a particular way. Which is to say, okay, well, we know how to get gradients of functions, right? So what I'm going to do is, you know, if I want grad f, I'll specify f per vertex and then take its gradient to get one vector per triangle, right? Then, well, one thing I could imagine doing to discretize the space of divergence-free fields would be to say, okay, well, I'm going to take the gradient and now just rotate it 90 degrees in the triangle plane. But then what's going to end up happening is something a little bit mysterious. Um, in particular, you're not going to be able to cover the entire 2f dimensional space of per triangle vector fields exactly. Because in fact, there's a larger space, the, like a larger set of dimensions in that 2f that's still left over once you account for the harmonic and curl free parts. Um, may, right? Remember the harmonic part being 2g, curl free part being v minus 1 dimensional. And it turns out the number of remaining dimensions is e minus 1. So it kind of suggests that the f for the divergence-free fields on the left-hand side shouldn't be expressed as one value per vertex, but rather one value per edge. This is surprising. This actually surprised me when I worked it out. In fact, for many years, I was discretizing these uh, r grad f's by just taking grad f's and rotating them. And that turns out to be like kind of weird from a discrete perspective. So, this idea, I think, dates back to Max Vardetsky's uh, PhD thesis, um, among a few other things at a similar time, where essentially what you end up with is if the structure that you want to preserve in your discrete theory of vector fields is the Helmholtz Hodge decomposition, then if you have vertex based gradient fields, like you use piecewise linear finite elements, then you somehow need edge based rotated gradient fields in order to complete that 2f dimensionality that we want in this uh, setup. Or, by the way, you could f swap the two, right? Like, if I, if I chose it being an edge-based gradient, then I could have a vertex-based uh, rotated gradient. But the basic point here is that I kind of have two different things that look related to gradients of functions, but the number of degrees of freedom doesn't agree. And that actually suggests a particular idea called mixed finite elements, where what you end up doing is using multiple finite element spaces to kind of represent similar objects in order to preserve nice structure that you might want. In particular, one thing you can do is specify uh, the rotated gradient fields by using an edge-based or non-conforming elements approach. This uh, it goes back to Vardetsky's work in 2006. Now here's kind of a funny thing that you could do, which actually feels really dirty initially, but then turns out to have really nice property, is, which is so far when we've specified a scalar function on a triangle, we've done so by giving the value of that function at its three vertices. Right? And the nice thing then is if I have a triangle mesh, then I can essentially specify a function on the entire triangle mesh by specifying one value per vertex and interpolating linearly along the triangle. But within a single triangle, I only need to know the value of the function at three points to specify the function everywhere. Those three points don't have to be the vertices. They can be anywhere, right? As long as I make that linear assumption, I just need three values of my function somewhere. So in the non-conforming elements world, one thing I could do would be to specify a value per uh, triangle 
by putting one number at the midpoint of every edge of my triangle mesh, and then linearly interpolating that, that value to the interior. Now, that's perfectly fine. I'll get, I'll get something linear in the interior of every triangle, but what ends up happening is something that looks like the picture on the right-hand side here, where now our functions sort of agree at the midpoints of edges, but then along the rest of the edge of the triangle, your function is actually discontinuous. So you have this really weird function space where you have one value per edge of every triangle on your mesh, right? So the space of functions on your mesh is now E-dimensional instead of V-dimensional. And notice there's, there's typically more edges than there are vertices on a triangle mesh, which means that this is actually a larger space of functions. And what explains that is that they're non-conforming. They're actually not continuous along the mesh edges. That said, there's still some notion of a gradient, as long as you kind of ignore that jump along the edge, which, for better or for worse, does happen on a measure zero set. Uh, in particular, in the interior of every triangle, you can still take exactly the same kind of piecewise linear uh, gradient that you did before. So what is proposed in Bardeski's thesis and some other uh, uh, places as well is to essentially say, okay, well, if I need an E minus one dimensional space of divergence free fields, one way that I can get that is by saying, well, when I do my rotated gradient operator, I'm gonna use the gradient of a non-conforming field for that rotated gradient part so that my dimensionalities work out. By the way, there's a relationship between the piecewise uh, linear triangle uh, or, or, or per vertex basis and per edge basis, right? Because they're both linear in a triangle. I'm giving you a nice uh, expression here. In any event, this non-conforming edge-based discretization um, leads you to the right uh, dimensionality for your divergence-free fields if you use a conforming discretization for the curl-free fields. Or you could do, you could flip the roles of those two things. Either one uh, is actually perfectly sensible. So anyway, this is kind of a funny, interesting idea where if you want to preserve a structure like the Helmholtz-Hodge decomposition, but you still want to cover the entire 2F dimensional space of phase space vector fields, you end up kind of needing to discretize different pieces of your Hodge decomposition in a different way. Um, so one thing we haven't done, by the way, is check that if you actually use these two bases for the rotated and non-rotated gradients, as well as a, a, a different basis for harmonic field, that you actually cover precisely the same two-dimensional, 2F dimensional space. Um, I'll refer you to uh, that thesis for, for more details, but hopefully you get that kind of high-level idea. Okay, let's clear up. Okay, so uh, in any event, um, one question you might ask is how much of this story kind of carries, o carries over to higher dimensional domains? Um, it turns out that, of course, per uh, triangle vector fields are perfectly readily extended to per tetrahedron uh, vector fields. But uh, the Helmholtz-Hodge decomposition becomes a little more complicated in 3D. Uh, I thought I'd point you guys to a recent paper that came out that actually works through uh, one version of a 3D Hodge decomposition. Uh, I believe this was at SIGGRAPH Asia last year, um, which not only explains the smooth theory of Helmholtz-Hodge uh, in this case, including all the boundary terms and everything else, um, but also works out a discrete uh, version of the same de decomposition using kind of similar degree of freedom style counting arguments, although in their case, they consider discretizations of vector fields that are on edges and faces, like triangular faces of tet meshes. Um, so anyway, I'll, I encourage you to give it a read. This is a nice paper with really beautiful figures to kind of understand what's going on in this volumetric case. Okay, so now you get some idea of some things that we can do with triangle-based vector fields. We're actually going to skip edge-based vector fields and defer to discussion of discrete exterior calculus. Um, again, I'm cutting it out of this course because we're out of time, uh, but if you give me a hard time, I do have slides and materials around on deck, and I'd be happy to record some lectures on that uh, at some point in the next month or two. But I did think I'd spend a few minutes discussing vertex-based uh, vector fields because they do have some interesting advantages, although the discrete structure preservation with an equal sign is often much more challenging in this setting. So to kind of summarize at a high level, the pros of having vertex-based uh, vector fields is that there's some possibility of higher order differentiation. Remember that our triangle-based uh, vector fields on triangle meshes 
are a little bit tricky to work with from a derivative perspective because essentially they don't have derivatives. They're just piecewise constant. Um, that included in both the conforming and non-conforming bases, by the way. Which, actually, now that I say it, doesn't make any sense. Those are bases for functions. But both of those gave us piecewise constant uh, vector fields. The, uh, the con uh, here uh, of a vertex-based field is that there isn't a natural tangent space that's attached to every vertex. Right? So a very typical thing to have to do if you're going to make a vertex-based field is also to keep track of a normal at every vertex so that you have a tangent plane. And moreover, sort of all the Gaussian curvature of your triangle mesh kind of lives right on top of the vertex, whereas notice that we did a sneaky thing in trivial connections. We kind of walked around the Gaussian curvature at a vertex, which can make some uh, technicalities in the construction. Now, there is one easy case for vertex-based fields, and that's specifically when your triangle mesh is planar, like all of the vertices are actually in the two-dimensional plane. And then it's perfectly fine to have one vector per vertex and to just linearly interpolate the x and y components to the interior of a triangle. And this actually gives a perfectly sensible derivative of a vector field as long as your triangle mesh has no curvature, it's just flat. Um, now, there are many applications where that's the case. Um, so in two dimensions, you have flat meshes when you're like deforming two-dimensional shapes, doing angry birds, that kind of stuff. Uh, and similarly, in three dimensions with tetrahedral meshes, um, it also makes sense to have a per vertex just x, y, z uh, for your vector field. Uh, and in that case, um, that's sort of a very typical uh, way to write down vector fields in physical simulation, where that really is uh, the basic setup. And then you do get at least one derivative of your vector field and can apply that first sort of finite element method that we derived in previous lectures. So as one example from my own research where we've used such a representation, um, one task that you might want to do is compute a vector field that looks as close to a rigid motion, like a rotation or a translation, while satisfying a few constraints. It turns out that rigid motion vector fields have the property that their Jacobian matrix plus its transpose is equal to zero. So that's an energy we can minimize over the space of vector fields. Um, this is readily discretized using piecewise linear finite elements and leads to a nice technique for uh, 2D shape deformation. Later on, my, my student Sebastian Kleich actually took this method and extended it to a very fast algorithm for surface parameterization, which shows up in computer graphics a lot. Now, the problem comes in the 3D case, or really I should say two-dimensional triangular meshes embedded in 3D. I don't mean tetrahedral meshes. And the reason is that I can't just linearly interpolate x and y components along the face of my triangle anymore, because as I move along the triangle, somehow the normal vector to my surface is changing as well, but I don't have access to kind of figure out how that's happening. So there have been a lot of different attempts to come up with reasonable discretizations of vector fields and their derivatives. Uh, in this case, one of the kind of popular techniques is to use something called the geodesic polar map, which is a little bit tricky. But essentially, the idea here is that maybe I take the neighborhood around every vertex, and then I kind of map it into the plane in this interesting kind of piecewise way, where what I do is I take the interior angles, like the alphas on the left-hand side, I rescale them to sum up to 2 pi, like in the flat vertex, and now I take like the sectors of those triangles, map them proportionally, uh, and then uh, do all of my vector field computation in that plane. So that allows you to kind of do some notion of parallel transport in a radial direction by kind of flattening out the mesh, taking the, the, the vector with you, sliding it across, and then unflattening again. And so this provides some notion of tangency, but there's some weird kind of continuity issues, right? Because as you move from one segment to another, uh, uh, now things can change more or less uh, rapidly. So this uh, strategy sort of preserves radial lines, but can uh, change their, their spacing uh, in the map into the plane. Uh, this actually was one of the early approaches to vector field design. In fact, the original paper called Vector Field Design on Surfaces from Zhang et al. in uh, 2006 used this kind of discretization. I think this is a little less popular today, although there are still some recent methods that, that make use of these sorts of tricks. Um, so I'll, I'll let you take a look at that paper uh, for some additional details. Uh, and in fact, just recently, uh, there is some, some additional work which gives a basis, derivatives, operators, and so on for per-vertex vector fields. 
um, using a bit more kind of careful setup that's a little more discreet and a little less discretized. Um, and this paper is, is quite complex. I decided not to cover it in our course, but again, I encourage you to give it a read. So in any event, today's lecture is a little short, and maybe we'll go on to, to watch our, our discussion of uh, normalizing flows and machine learning to balance out our graphics machine learning combination in this course. But hopefully you get the idea that there really are many different ways to place tangent vectors on a triangle mesh, um, and there's no single best answer. In fact, actually, there are even other more creative representations of uh, vector fields on triangle meshes out there. Uh, and it's kind of a really fun problem to think about the different ways that you might represent a field. Um, so for example, here's a more exotic choice, which is to use operators to encode fields. This is explored by Omri uh, Azimkot, uh, Miri Benchan, and colleagues. Uh, and they had a number of follow-up papers that showed you can even use this representation for uh, simulation problems, like simulating wine dripping down the side of a uh, wine glass. Here's a, the basic idea. And in fact, this idea also is used in theory sometimes. I believe uh, Spivak's uh, differential geometry textbook actually thinks of vector fields this way, which is to say, if I have a vector field at every point on a surface, I can take that vector field and I can turn it into an operator that inputs functions and then outputs functions. And the way that I do that is I input a function. At every point on my surface, I take the directional derivative of that function along the surface in the direction of my vector field, and I output the, uh, a new function where at every point I give you back that directional derivative value in the vector field direction. And it turns out that that sort of operator way of thinking about vector fields is actually quite convenient mathematically. Um, it turns out if you kind of look at linear operators, you can figure out which ones correspond to vector field derivatives or directional derivatives pretty easily. Um, and given the sort of functional maps idea that we've talked about earlier in this course, earlier, later, actually we haven't covered it yet in this course, I'm sorry, I'm filming these lectures out of order. Um, uh, essentially, we can talk about maps between domains um, by means of using functions on our surface. And this sort of operator-based approach to expressing tangent vector fields turns out, turns out to be kind of nicely compatible with that. So for instance, it turns out if you have very low order, low frequency basis for functions on a surface, this sort of operator approach to representing a tangent vector field might make sense. Uh, and it actually has some interesting simulation uh, applications in addition to vector field design. Um, I believe basically the same set of authors also worked out like what would be a covariant derivative operator, a Lie derivative, and so on, specifically in this interesting language. And then an emerging topic just recently has been to study what happens as you sort of take vector fields and try to make them compatible with subdivision operators. So for those of you who took my 6837 undergrad course in computer graphics, we talk about subdivision, which is a technique for taking meshes and kind of subdividing all of their elements to make even more detailed and smoother meshes with more elements. One question you might ask is if I have a coarse mesh with like a coarse space base or edge base vector field on it, and now I subdivide the mesh, can I kind of subdivide the field along with the mesh? And just recently, uh, there's been some work on that, and it shows that you can get some of the benefit of working with smooth vector fields rather than this discretized thing, while still working with the degrees of freedom in the kind of coarse discrete space by pushing your vector fields through uh, these different subdivision operators. So we haven't really covered subdivision in this course, but I thought it was an interesting kind of new area and one that might be worth taking a look at uh, for those of you who are looking for interesting reading uh, to do for your assignments here. So in any event, uh, hopefully you see that today uh, was just a quick discussion to give you some idea of the sorts of problems that arise when uh, discretizing fields on uh, surfaces and, and meshes specifically. This is a very big area of research and one that is really actively studied in the computer graphics domain. Every year at SIGGRAPH, SGP, and, and related conferences, we see more and more work in this particular direction. So I encourage you to look there for some really creative and interesting ways to discretize vector fields and their derivatives and solve interesting vector field design problems. With that, I think we'll stop today's lecture. There's an additional lecture segment that we may get to watch in class, or you can certainly watch on YouTube, that covers an application of vector fields in very high dimensional spaces in machine learning for variational inference problems in normalizing flows. Uh, I think it's really fun because it uses very similar language, uh, but to a very different end, like variational inference. 
Uh, but with that, we'll uh, conclude this discussion. And next time I see you, we'll kind of pick up in a very different segment of this course where essentially the last part of this course is a big grab bag of related um, geometry topics that I think are important to cover in, in an advanced topics geometry class. And when I say important, I really mean just fun for me. So in any event, we'll see you then.